I guess my question to you is, can you relate? You know, I'm probably one of the most impatient people ever when it comes to that kind of stuff. Isn't that true? <laughs> I'm not good at waiting in line. I'm not really good driving in traffic. But once again, this video hit me right between the eyes. I said, you really don't know what's going on with somebody else at that time. You know, you want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And you never, you, we just never know. Uh, so we need to be probably a little bit more considerate of what's going on, you know, with people. We, you know, all kinds of things can go on. You know, these people that drive crazy, they, they may have a reason. They may not. You know, old country comedian Jerry Clower, he tells a story about a time that there was a severe drought in the area that he lived in. And the people of the town, they were afraid uh, there would be a fire. And they don't have enough water to really put those fires out because they'd have to draw it up. And they had a volunteer fire department there and everything. But sure enough, one day a fire started in a building in their town. And the volunteer fire department, they were doing everything they could to put that fire out. But they weren't being very successful. Many people of the town, they were upset. They were crying. And they were afraid that that building was going to lead to other buildings burning down right there in the town. So right in the middle of fighting the fire, they heard a sound coming down the road. And it was Uncle Versy and Aunt Pet Ledbetter. Some of you may know the story. They were coming in their old rusted truck just as hard as they could with all 11 children hanging off the truck and the fenders and everything else. And it was rattling and banging and coming as hard as it could come. And he tells how the people just parted and got out of the way because they were moving on. And they drove right up in the middle of that building, right into that fire, and jumped out of that truck and started jumping around and stomping and beating that fire out. And Aunt Pat had her bonnet off, and she's beating the fire. And they put the whole fire out right then and there. The townspeople, they were so thankful and so excited. They called Uncle Versy a hero, and they started to raise money for him. They wanted to raise money to pay them and give them some money for what they just did. And they did that. And they asked old Uncle Versy, he said, just what is it you plan to do with all that money? He said, first thing I'm going to do is get them brakes fixed on that truck. <laughs> we never know what's going on with somebody, amen? I can relate. You know, as we sit here today and worship, do we really know the people around us? When you look to your neighbors, do you really know anything about them? Do we just come set every Sunday morning, sit beside someone, smile, talk to them? But do we really know that person? Do we really know anything about their life? Sometimes we reveal how it's uh, that we truly don't know these people. Even though we attend church with them every Sunday morning, we really don't know a whole lot about them. Everyone has a story. Everyone, remember that. Everyone has a story. You know, while at the tomb of Jesus Christ, uh, after he was crucified, Mary Magdalene was standing outside the tomb weeping when she turns and sees Jesus. But she doesn't realize who he is and mistakes him right then for the gardener. So if you would turn with me this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 20, verse 11. This uh, passage I'm reading is coming out of the NLT. I know uh, we talked about this. I've got several Bibles that I pull scripture out of, just depending on, at the time, which one is really the clearest and works best. So this is out of the NLT. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. It says, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stood and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying, the angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. 
Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which in Hebrew means teacher. She recognized him immediately. But she could have missed this because she didn't really know who he was. Amen? In another account, two disciples were walking on the road to Damascus and are joined by someone who they take to be a complete stranger. They walk and talk with him for hours and they still, still don't know that the stranger is Jesus Christ. Let's go over to Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. This will be out of the NIV. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to, the, to a village called Damascus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas, Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days. What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and the other rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was, one of the, was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter the, his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as they were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went, he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he broke bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. We never know when Jesus is right there with us. Amen. We never know how he's going to reveal himself to us. You know why? Because we're too busy judging people to realize that that might be Jesus Christ or someone Jesus Christ sent to us to see how we reveal him. Amen. Sometimes we're in judgment really quick about things. And we make mistakes. You know, couldn't we be doing this same thing? You know why? One reason we do that is sometimes we show favoritism between people. We might ask this person, not this other one, because we really don't care for them. So that's called favoritism. And Peter tells us about that in Acts chapter 10, 30, verse 34. He says, now I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. He does not show favoritism. Neither should we. We should be open-minded about everyone. Amen? Try to find the good in everyone. My wife does that, no matter what's going on. Tries to find the good in every situation in everyone. And I'm going to tell you right now, she's better at it than I am. A whole lot better at it. She keeps me grounded sometimes with that. Because it's easy to get off track. So once again, I ask you, do you really know the people sitting next to you this morning? Are the people around you in service each week? Or just the people around you in your job, your, your family, or when you're in a day-to-day -day routine? Do you really know anything about the people that you come in contact with every day? You know, there's a story about an elderly woman who walked into the local country church. The friendly usher at the front door greeted her at the door, handed her a bulletin, and asked, where would you like to sit? She, she replied to him, the front row, please. 
The usher explained, you really don't want to do that because the pastor is really boring and tends to spit a little when he preaches. <laughs> the lady looked sternly at the usher and said, do you have any idea who I am? The usher replied, no, ma'am, I don't. I'm the preacher's mom, she said. <laughs> After a really awkward moment of silence, the usher said, ma'am, do you have any idea who, idea who I am? No, I don't, she replied. He said, good, let me show you where your seat is. <laughs> Be careful what you say about me. I have a lot of friends in here. Even though they're telling you the truth, be careful. <laughs> How many of you knew this about the people around you? Did you know that Buster Branwell right here, his mom and dad were deaf? And that's why Buster knows sign language. God gave him a gift. Not only was it good for his mom and dad, but he's using that gift now and every day. We call that a calling. right? God put it right before him. Many of you may not know about my wife, Terry. She was a victim of sexual abuse, was raised by uneducated parents, and was an eighth grade dropout who is now working on her college master's degree right now. She's also just been hired as a recruiter for Navarro College. Proud of you. My Aunt Jean Taylor is not here today, but I know they're watching online. Many of you know her and Tommy Taylor. She drove a special needs bus for 40 years because she took care of two special needs sisters when she was growing up she told me that she realized now that that was her calling cj smith he's not here this morning but many of you may not know cj smith was associate pastor at another cowboy church and our band leader nick hunt almost died in an explosion where he worked at the time did you know that Nick wasn't supposed to be here. Nick wasn't even sure if he's supposed to be doing what he's doing today. But thank God he's here doing it today. Amen. So once again, do we really know the people around us? Wouldn't it be great to get to know them a little bit better? Do we truly know who our neighbors are? That's something very important to God. It should be to us. Turn with me this morning. We're going to Matthew chapter, 24, uh, chapter 25, beginning at verse 31. This piece of scripture reveals to us who our neighbor is. I think it's 24. Maybe it's not. <laughs> oh, I got this all screwed up. I got home and I, from the bass tournament, and I guess I got lost. <laughs> nope, I'm not even close. I don't know where it was. <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? <laughs> what do he say? <laughs> Paraphrase it. Okay, we'll paraphrase it. Who is our neighbor? If you remember the Good Samaritan, that's a good example. He didn't know who that person was lying in the ditch, been beat up and robbed. He didn't know who that was. And it said priest and rabbi and people walked right by him and left him laying in the ditch or they'd walk to the other side of the road to get away from him. But the good Samaritan stopped. Picked him up, helped him, took him to an inn and said, hey, whatever he needs, I'll be back. 
and I'll pay for whatever needs to be done to take care of him. That's what a good neighbor looks like. The neighbor that's got your back in times of trouble and times of good, that's a good neighbor. Someone that cares about someone else so deeply that they'd go out of their way to give up what's personal to them to help someone else. That's a good neighbor. Amen. Many people tell us and they say they love the Lord. You probably hear that all the time. Yeah, I love the Lord. But we can't genuinely love God until we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. So do you truly love the Lord? To know what, or to know that we have the Spirit of God living inside us, we just need to look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And in this famous passage, the Apostle Paul describes these characteristics of love to the believers in the church at Corinth. So if you'd go with me, we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Many of you that have been here for a long time, many of you that walk in the Christian faith, you read your Bibles, you know this passage. It's used at many, many weddings because it is a true example. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at first four, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking and it's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Amen. And in verse 13, Paul makes this statement. If we skip on down to verse 13, Paul makes this statement. He says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen? Amen. What's the meaning of faith? In the Bible, Hebrews 11, 1 tells us now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is where you are so focused on Jesus Christ. It's where you walk daily knowing that there's something after you leave this world. Amen? Faith. The faith in Jesus Christ. And our hope. Our hope is found in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. Where it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Amen. Amen. And we know what that love looks like because we just read 1 Corinthians. And it shows us what love really should look like. I always tell people, if you go back and read this, 1 Corinthians, and where it says love is patient, love is kind, take the love out and say, Reggie is patient, which that's not true. Reggie is kind. I think I can get there. You know what I'm saying? Put your name where love is, and if you can fit in there, then you got the Holy Spirit firing up in you, right? You're walking in the Holy Spirit because that's what we need to be like. And that's how we should treat our neighbor. Not assuming about things it's easy in this world to do that can we just imagine how much better our world would be if we were to start to view the people we run into each day with attitude of love and understanding pretty tough isn't it easy to say hard to do and even though there are a lot of jerks out there running around and upsetting our day we may never know when it could be Jesus that is allowing us the opportunity to reveal him through our words and our actions because we run into him every day. They always say a smile can change things in a heated moment. I believe that. I believe that's something as a gift God gave to us. Blessed are the peacemakers. We need to remember that in every situation. So today, I would suggest that we try to find a little more patience. Don't pray for patience. Don't believe me, read Job. When dealing with people in this world, is this possible that we may not even have a clue of what's going on in their life or what they've been through at that, or what's going on right there in that moment? You know, I, I'm probably the worst when it comes to driving because I'm like this lady. You can't hardly... 
tolerate the way people act. Go to Colorado. You think they drive bad here? <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful state. It's just uh, some people are driving around without a clue at all. So, But you have to be patient, right? Amen. But let us as Christians today show a little more love, a little more compassion to others, just like Jesus showed us. But Jesus showed us all kinds of compassions. He knew we were sinners. We have faults. We have shortcomings. But this man died on the cross to forgive us of all that. He died on a cross to forgive us for all that. And we complain when we have to forgive something for somebody, something so simple just by saying, I forgive you. You're not hanging on a cross. Amen. 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 Just remember how simple that is in your day-to-day walk. Learn to love a little bit more and get rid of the hate and bitterness in your, in your life. The Bible tells us that. We need to get rid of that wrath, bitterness, hatefulness. We need to eliminate that out of our lives. Not only is that good for other people, it's good for you. It's good for you because when you walk around with that going on, first of all, that other person may not even know. But when you walk around with that, what is that guy said? You got a prune face? (laughs) Who wants to talk to somebody with a prune face, right? (laughs) And if we're going to be honest here, if you got one, tell them they got one, right? (laughs) Put a smile on. Reveal Jesus Christ in everything you do and everyone you talk to. And not only will their day get better, but your day is going to get better. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift this day to you, Father. We are so thankful for the blessings and favor you pour out on us. You pour out on your church house here, Lord. And Father, we look forward to what you have for us in the future. Father, today I pray that you uh, humble us. Father, that we would be more patient, show more love to the ones around us. That we'd get to know our neighbors better, Father, and that we would reveal you in everything we do. Father, that we might, by that chance, draw people closer to you. That they might come to know you. Father, let us not just say we're Christians. Let us live like Christians. Father, we love you and we praise you. And we pray today that everything we said, everything we did was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.